Ihr Lieben, herzlich willkommen zu deinem Lieblingspodcast, dem Tobias Beck Podcast. Wir haben heute eine englische Folge. Wenn du das Ganze hier bei YouTube siehst, dann kannst du einfach auf den Button unter YouTube drücken und das wird dann automatisch übersetzt. Im Podcast wird das Ganze auf Englisch sein. And today, oh no, I gotta say that in German, one last thing. Ich habe nämlich heute einen Gast bei mir, er ist schon das dritte Mal im Podcast und er ist eine absolute Inspiration, nämlich den Autor von dem Buch Das Café am Rande der Welt und Big Five for Life. Und er hat noch ein Buch geschrieben, I just said you wrote another book, it's unbelievable. Und da geht es über, um die Überraschung. Can you say the word Überraschung? That's actually very difficult. Überraschung? Oh, nice, yeah. Überraschung, which is a surprise. At the cafe, at the end of the world. Also, in diesem Sinne, uh, for the third time in my podcast, such a, pr a privilege having you here. Um, the, the big introduction was already done three, two times, but I'm still, I still want to say that you are the number one best-selling inspirational book author for me, actually, in the entire world. And uh, he has, the, the, the book that I read first of him is Big Five for Life, which I think every every one of you has read already. He um, his work has been translated into now listen 43 languages and sold more than seven million copies. That's unbelievable. Uh, okay, um, now I feel bad. Well, my book is now in India. Okay, <laughs> there there um, he and actually and that's what I would like to share with you. We have been in contact since our first interview. We had a dinner together in Frankfurt, which I will never forget. And we have a lot in common, our journey in personal development. And uh, actually, before we started this recording, we talked a little bit about loss and yeah. surprises that can happen. And actually, I think that it's okay if the community hears it, because both of our fathers passed away within the last year. Yeah. And uh, we talked yeah, about how that was. It's it's a tough <laughs> tough thing to go to to deal with to accept to embrace. Um, when I when I wrote the third book in the cafe series, that book was about the struggles I had experienced with getting older, and part of it was dealing with my father getting closer and closer to the end of his story, and then yeah, he passed away in May of last year, um, which seems like just yesterday. You know, yeah. when I think about when I think about him, uh, and I think part of the struggle with that is that you realize that on the depth chart, you're now the next guy up, and so that's kind of tough to deal with. That's kind of tough to accept. Then there's the fact that you can't just pick up the phone and call. Uh, you know, mm. there's certain bonds that you have with certain people. Uh, my dad taught me to fish. He taught me the outdoors. And so on a particularly good day, when I had a great kayaking trip, I saw something really cool. Like he's the guy that I would pick up and call on the drive home. And mm. so now I have that experience, but I pick up the phone and I, I think, oh, you know, there's like that momentary pause. Mm. And, uh, but, but I, you, you talked about the big five for life book in the sequel book, which is all about dealing with letting go and accepting these things. I wrote a one page, um, it's not a poem exactly, but it's just a one page piece talking about why do the bright lights go out? Mm. And I firmly believe that when people leave that are part of our circle, one of the greatest gifts they give, and I want to hear your perspective on this, Toby, is that by when they leave, they remind the rest of us of how precious our life is. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. And we talked about a little bit about the fact that um, when you have experienced something like this, that you also get a deeper understanding for people who are in pain mm -hmm. and um, your books that have reached millions. We're not talking about thousands, but millions of people around the world they cannot prevent what happens or happened, but they can, so to say, help you um, think about the situation in a, from a different perspective, let me say yeah. it this way. And that's really, I think, why the books flow through me is I always say I'm, I'm the first person who's supposed to read them because my struggles, my challenges, my um, life situations that I can't quite figure out are the things that I'm dealing with. And then as I start to unravel answers, then those become part of the books. And so, yeah, that is my hope. Uh, one of the greatest things that I love, and I'm going to be finally coming back to Germany shortly. So hopefully we'll be seeing each other in person again soon in, in the upcoming months. But one of the things that really makes my heart just feel so good is when I'm standing doing events or signing books and someone says, I felt so alone 
And then I read your books and I didn't feel alone anymore. Wow. Because I remember what it felt like to feel like I was the only one. I was the only one thinking these things and I felt very alone. But it's not the case. Like there are millions of us out there all around the world asking these bigger questions. We're not alone. Yeah. The the main character that goes to the cafe am Rande der Welt, uh, looking for answers, looking for new perspective in uh, your newest book, looking for um Uh, you actually said, what's the word, über? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just said it so I could repeat it. I got to practice that one though. Überraschung. <laughs> Überraschung, yeah. Überraschung for, for surprises is actually that. It's a person that's different than the masses asking different questions. And if you ask different questions, you get different answers. And um, I remember the last talk we had, um, you were missing your adventures in life because you were yeah. traveling, you are an outdoor person, uh, you are, you love doing that. And then you were pretty much as we all were locked in. And my first question regarding your new book, Café am Rande der Welt, Überraschung, uh, is, or Überraschung am, am, Café, am Rande der Welt, is um, how is it linked to you? Were you missing surprises did you miss it so much you wrote a book about it <laughs> <laughs> you know it's it's funny the way so i don't write just because a year has passed you and i were talking a little bit about this before we started the recording but i don't uh feel that okay it's uh, another year i need to write a book it's not like that at all i feel that when something builds inside of me and says now this is a story that wants to be told then i listen um, because I firmly believe the stories are definitely coming from somewhere else through me. I get to be the conduit for it and perhaps add a tiny bit of my own, um, my own expertise, but that it's, it's so much bigger than me. And in this case, this is the first time that the main character is not John. The main character is a 15 year old young girl and she is struggling with life. She is struggling with a very challenging home life. And she's kind of not kind of, she's lost faith in life. And she finds the cafe at just the right time and finds Casey and finds Emma and finds Mike and finds Max. And Max is a character that I introduced in a very short story about Christmas many, many years ago. And it's crazy, Toby, because I never thought that that would be a character that I would see again. But then Max came about in the third book in the cafe series. And Max plays a very big part in the life of Hannah in, in the fourth book. Um, and I think there's reasons for that. I think that all of us ideally are looking for someone who's, who's there to help us mm. to know that we are not alone. And in this case, sometimes it's the wisdom of someone who's a bit older. So Max is like, he's 80 years old, right? He's been around the block. He's seen everything. And the other thing that Max offers is perspective because as tough as Hannah's life is, Max's life was even tougher. Mm. And that's a really good life lesson sometimes for us to be reminded of that is, As difficult as this moment might be, there's somebody out there and this moment is even more difficult for them. And, and, think, and it's so interesting because we talked about exactly that on a private pre-talk yeah. to, uh, to this recording that um, there are these situations in life that are so painful. And then when you compare it to somebody else, um, you see, okay, I'm still very lucky. Yeah. Yeah. In, in that yeah. perspective, because I mean, let's face it. Yes, our dads have passed away, but we are, we are still alive. It's yeah. we are still living. Yeah. And we got to know them for however many, you said your dad was 82, 83. 83, yeah. 83. My dad lived to be 79. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's plenty of people who lost their dads when they were children and they didn't get 70 years to get to know yeah. them or have them be there as a source of, of guidance or help or whatever. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's, One of my favorite questions to ask when things are going different than I expect is, and this is something that it took me a long time to learn, but to ask that question, why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. And from a place of curiosity, from a place of I'm open to whatever wisdom I'm going to get in that regard. And very often what I get is exactly what you described. This is a moment to be in gratitude. It may not feel like it right now, but if you can find the gratitude in this moment, you'll start to understand the meaning behind what you're experiencing. Yeah. And for thousands of years, it was normal that a 15-year-old asked the oldest of the tribe for help. Yeah. And that's what I actually like about this story. Um, yes, you can find help amongst yourselves, 
but there are people who do have a lot more experience. And as you just said, they have a different ankle to your life because they have already lived it. They might not have done the whole Instagram, YouTube thing. No, but they have, <laughs> they have lived life. And yeah. uh, this is what I like about the story. It's, it's, coming, it's coming back, asking for help. And I, I think one of the other things I love about it, and again, this is something that evolves during the course of the process. So when I sit down and start writing, it's happening so fast in my mind that I'm trying to just keep up on the keyboard. The dialogue is happening so fast. I see the characters moving. I see what they're saying. I see the actions. I see their emotions on their faces. And I, don't, I won't spoil the ending of the book, but there is this really precious moment at the end um, where Max and Hannah are interacting. And you realize that as much as Max is helping Hannah, that Hannah is also there to help Max. Mm. And mm. I love that too, the fact that there is this reciprocity in the universe that pairs us with people who we can be a guide for and that they can be a guide for us at any age. I, mean, I know you're a dad. How many times have your kids said something that you're like, wow, like that's a brilliant piece of wisdom, either the way that oh, yeah, they're acting in a given a moment. Sure. Yeah, same here. Same here, you know, and here, here we are the one with decades more life experience. And it's the tiny little human who's six years old or 10 years old or whatever, offering this brilliant piece of life wisdom. Mm -hmm. And, and the, this, this age thing that is pretty much um, in the book, one is old, one is young. Um, but there's this point where it pretty much the age doesn't matter anymore because they're, yeah. they're just together. And this togetherness, I think is also a, something that all your all your books um have to if i if i describe your books it's all about unity coming together talking with other people about your life plan and then getting this this ankle that could help you go your yeah. next step and that actually it started in your first book and it, it's it goes through all of them it's about unity and helping each other yeah and i think that life is uh designed in that way. So you can definitely try and do things on your own. And it, at the start, it has to be you. You have to, if you don't believe in whatever it is that you're striding for, if you don't believe in the path that you say you want to walk, it's going to be very difficult to get up every morning and be motivated to actually walk that path. Mm -hmm. That said, if you've identified your personal big five for life, if you've identified this is the life that I want to live, it's going to be so much easier if you allow yourself to get help from others and give help too, mm -hmm. because sometimes it's in the process of giving help to someone else that you get your greatest ahas in life. Those are the angles that you never could have seen if you were only focused on you walking your path. Yeah. So the combination of those things to me is part of what I call the cosmic algorithm of the universe. Mm -hmm. There's just these certain guiding principles. And when you master these principles, that's when you really accelerate your life. And one of them is be open to the possibility of getting help from others. Embrace that. And, and, where, want time, to help. and where time, if that what Einstein says is true, then time doesn't even exist. Then yeah. it melts. Yeah. 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 And, and I've, had that, I've had that happen. It, it, I think all of us have probably had that happen. I remember sitting in, I think of this because I was just helping my daughter with math yesterday and she's oh. working on algebra. <laughs> and she's working uh, on- uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> It's, in it's, Germany, it's, we don't have that. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's it's uh, the slope of a line. So y equals I'm MX kidding. I, I just e. hate it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, here's what's so funny about this, Toby. So you wonder how much is genetic, how much is trained, all the rest of that, right? So I distinctly remember being in school and having them teach this y equals MX plus B slope of the line. And I was like, what? Like, I, I just don't understand it, right? Well, luckily, as you progress as an adult, things you start to see bigger picture things, et cetera. But so I'm helping my daughter and I feel in I feel her frustration sitting next to me and I feel my own frustration rebuilding as I'm looking at this and trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you stay with these things, you have this broader perspective, you can help the person next to you, they can help you, you get by, right? And part of life is figuring out this is not my thing. And <laughs> I think as y equals mx plus b goes, that is not my thing. So I can pass yeah. on that. And and if we stay in this context, um, in the first book, Café am Rande der Welt, pretty the 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 main character pretty much stumbles in. It was like a yeah. coincidence. Uh, did did she run away or did she go there um, because she, she needed she she needed to go somewhere? Yeah. So I believe that in much the same way that. 
the book finds you when you're ready. Like very often people will say, I was walking through the bookstore and your book fell off the shelf in front of me, or I, I noticed it on a table and I picked it up and I just couldn't put it down for some reason. Mm. I think if we're open to it, the book finds us. And I think in terms of the cafe, that Hannah is at a moment in her life when she is, she's at one of those major inflection points. She's either going to get the new angle perspective that you talked about, or things are just going to go downhill. And so the cafe finds her and she finds the cafe at just the right moment in time. Mm -hmm. And she has to have a willingness to be there, which is part of what you experience as a reader to see her, her going through the emotional challenge of, do I stay or do I go? Am I supposed to be here? Am I allowed to be here? Am I good enough to be here? Which I think is a question we often ask ourselves. Especially and when as she, a 15 year old. Yeah, right. Yeah, totally. And so that's part of her story. Part of her journey is, does she embrace the cafe and her presence in the cafe? Hmm. Many young people don't know that they don't know. And to be honest, uh, uh, I, for the longest time, thought I knew, but I didn't know anything. So the questions <laughs> that, I, you, uh, you know, that process, you think you have an understanding, but then you meet someone or a book and you see, okay, wow, I, I don't know anything. Yeah. And actually the whole area of personal development or the building of a character um, of a young person with 15, where already 15 years are there. They, they have experience, but if everything runs well, they have their whole life in front yeah. of them. And then yeah. this one talk can make a difference for the next 40, 50, 60 years. This one sentence, I don't know if it, how it is in your life, but when I was in that age, one sentence of another person can change an entire life path. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Do you, I mean, to that point, do you remember one of those moments in your life? Do you remember one of those people or one of those sentences? It's hard to think back when it's, you know, decades in the past, but. I remember one teacher at school when I was, I was a very bad, bad student, I told you, but there was one teacher. He said, uh, because I always said, there's nothing I can do. I'm not good at anything. Some are good in sports, others in music. I wasn't good in anything. And he said, that's not true. You can speak very well. Mm. You should probably one day speak in front of thousands of people. But then it took 25 years yeah. before I had my first stage because, yeah, my, my, my self-esteem didn't allow me to do something else than being a flight attendant. You know the story. Yeah. But yes, the sentence was always there, like a silent whispering you know that's beautiful yeah, yeah. you think about those, your life you think about those people that yeah they they drop they plant that seed right mm -hmm. and it's up to us whether we decide to let that seed grow into something or to harvest whatever it is um, but that's the chance we have is to plant that seed for other people and um, other people can sometimes see something we don't see totally but, so what yeah. what was your sentence when you were 15 I'm trying to think if there was one defining sentence by somebody. I, I remember one person in particular. So when we used to go on these outdoor trips, uh, one of my dad, so it used to be my dad and me and a couple of his cousins, uh, sort of like, you know, this guy trip and we would go out and, and go hiking or fishing, whatever. And there was this one guy, his name's Jack. And Jack had this just spectacular way of asking great questions. And so my dad was kind of, uh, this is the way it is, you know, like as if it was fact, he had his opinion and, and it was reflective of the fact that he actually struggled with his own insecurities. And so mm -hmm. to not appear insecure, he would state it as if this was it, this was truth. And Jack used to say, well, I hear what you're saying. I just wonder if, what if this might be the case, you know? This super soft, super subtle way of invoking a different way of thinking about the topic. And I'll mm. never forget that. I honestly think if I had not been in the car hearing him do that, I don't think I ever would have learned it. And it's funny you asked that question, Toby, because I was reflecting a couple of years back, like my books are all about asking questions. And where did that come from? I honestly think it, I owe it all to those moments, that guy and Isn't hearing so him demonstrate for me, like this is the way you help people think about a topic in a different way. 
Hmm. And and uh, w when you were that age of that character of your book right now, how I asked you that question before about your last book, but how much of her is in you? I mean, I was not a super confident kid, so that part of it is reflected in Hannah's character. I also didn't know who I wanted to be and uh, what my path was. It's funny because some people, like they're 12, 13, 14, they know this is who they I want to be. Yeah, to be. they know. And, and that's awesome, right? Uh, if that happens to be your path, that was definitely not me. So in that regard, I would say that I'm very similar uh, to the Hannah character. I think Hannah, I don't think I know, Hannah is more streetwise than I was. She's got an internal degree of self-confidence that I didn't have. Um, but uh, I, there's always part of me in all of the characters, without a doubt. I don't think I could write the way they feel and the things that they're thinking about if I hadn't experienced some of those things as well. Do you believe that that uh, Hannah and Max they they will meet again? I mean, because your books do have a spiritual hint in it, and you say yeah. that it pretty much comes through you. Um, will they meet again? Have they met before? Do you believe in that? Because I I just read a after my dad passed away, as we already talked about it. I read a book about how souls decide to meet, mm -hmm. and I thought I think that's very interesting because if there are angels max giving advice to her and actually later vice versa maybe there is a big master plan that they should meet that she should have gone to the cafe yeah yeah i'm fascinated by that as well these soul that's i've heard it called a soul cluster or soul mm -hmm. family and that there's, a, there's actually be... a, also a, um, a for children a children movie from i think it's pixar or disney They, okay. where, where, yeah, about that story, which, where children are told that everything is a choice. Huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I I like that version. In, in Safari des Liebens, I talk about what I think is my perspective on it, that you are definitely something before you're born. Prior to birth, you look at all of the possibilities of life, and you pick the challenges that you want to try and overcome. You probably pick a degree of the setting in which you want to arrive. And then next thing you know, there you are, you're born and you're a combination of your parents' DNA. But I will tell you, and again, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. From Literally from the moment that my daughter was born, I had the very clear sense that she was her own little spirit, her own little entity, that it wasn't that she was just my daughter. She was already something that was uniquely her and her own. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the way it works. I think we arrive and then we start to try and figure out what is, what are the challenges that I've picked for myself? And these things start to manifest and then we try and overcome them. Um, but I like this idea that you're talking about that you're not alone in it, that there's, there's other people, maybe they're part of your soul cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're angels. I don't know, but that there's other people around you. And I don't know. I mean, how many times in your life have you ever come across someone that you didn't know at all? And you just felt a connection to them. Like, why would that be if we didn't have something that actually was connecting us? I, I don't see any other possibility other than that. Especially if the if it if it affects an entire life. Yeah. 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 But when uh, yeah, I believe that children definitely they're already ready. They are, we can only be their guardian. I always yeah. say in Ge the German word is Reisebegleiter. It's like um Somebody you had in a tour bus, you know, look on the left, there is this, look on the right, you know, and please fasten your seatbelts. But yep. that's I like that. I like that word guardian that you use, because I think that's really the way that I see it as well. We're there to protect them and share any wisdom that we have, but they're on their own journey. And so but now that's it's not about controlling them. Yeah, but that, now that's getting interesting. In your book, she had to meet Max. Yeah. It could have been the father, it could have been the mother, it could have been the grandfather or whoever, but right. it's, it's a stranger. It's a stranger yeah. she meets. Yeah. Okay, let's go into that for a moment because I think that's also interesting. So there must be something you learn in your family and there must be something that is pretty much in your, in your life where other people come to help and then they leave again. Well, I think within the family, there's a collective story the minute you branch outside of your family, now you're in another person's story, another timeline, another uh, group of experiences and collective insights. And so if we were to only stay within the one story, I think there's a limit to how much we could learn. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And when we go outside of that, so like just you and I sitting down at dinner that night and hearing your story, that expanded my perception and my understanding of life mm-hmm. in a way that wouldn't if I was only having dinner with my sister or my parents, because I, I know that story, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think part of the reason that Hannah and Max, uh, their lives intersect is because they come from different backgrounds and yet they have some shared commonalities. And so again, those lenses that you talked about, those angles through which we can look at life, it's a benefit of having somebody else's angles to help us see our own life in a different perspective. Mm-hmm. And Max is in a phase at his life where he pretty much uh, is there to reflect. Yeah. And to give back this, I, I had a very interesting discussion uh, with a physician recently, amazing guy. He's, he's a, an MD, he's a homeopath and he's in his 60s. And I, I was asking him, what's different for you at this phase of your life? Mm-hmm. And he said, honestly, at this phase, it's really about giving back. He said, the, the achievements, the accomplishments, all the rest of that sort of fades away by the time you get to be about 60. And then it's, you start to focus on leaving your legacy more and more and making sure that you're sharing the information. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's definitely the case with Max. Yeah, and, and he has time for being present. I think what's yeah. missing a lot in our fast life where we switch left and right and where everything is so fast and yeah. if i don't like a, a netflix series i i watch it for <laughs> not even two minutes i watch it 35 seconds okay next somebody yeah. has worked on that movie for hours and years and no next we swipe and there's this age where max is where you take time and where you are present you put your yeah. smartphone aside there's just this girl in front of you. And I think this is a phase that it's that, that's beautiful in life. Also knowing that time is endless and that's why time is so special in the moment. Yeah, and the more that we can absorb that perspective, no matter what age we are, I think the happier we become. Mm. Because that's, these moments, you're right. We look at it from a big picture, like total life perspective. But as we were talking about before, that different life experiences help you look at something totally differently. Being a parent, you look at a year totally different Mm. because the amount that a kid will grow and progress in a year is staggering. What the adjustments that they make from one year to two year, walking, starting to talk, all the rest of that. So you say, well, you know, I I missed a year of their life. No big deal. Really? Because you missed a huge progression you know, and then it continues to change. So when they're in eighth grade and about to go to high school, which is where I'm at with my daughter, this is the last year that I have before she'll be in the pre-college phase. Like that's what high that's school is, is yeah. the pre-college phase. And so, oh, you just missed a year, no big deal. But if I miss this particular year, there's a huge growth of like getting more and more comfortable with independence um, you know, we just got her, her debit card the other day and I was with her so she could test and do a transaction on her own. Right. Cause she's going to go to the mall. <laughs> you, just put, you just put 10 bitcoins on them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. But this idea that now your, your little baby is grown up to the As point where you're going to go to the mall and have a debit card and the independence that comes with that. These are all beautiful phases of life. And if you're, you're right, if we're so busy that we miss these, they're gone forever. It's not just that your life ends, but they're gone forever. Those moments are gone. Can you imagine that she's moving out or going away to ask somebody else for wisdom like Hannah does or did? Yeah, a hundred percent. So one of the, there's always the yin and yang of technology and these things, right? So one of the things that is awesome is when kids have questions these days, they can get on Google and type in questions and they can get different perspectives. Now, of course, there's potential risk with that. It's like, well, where are they getting the information from? So that's part of parenting. Um, But at the same time, it can open up dialogues that are so different. You know, we talk about everything. She and I talk about everything, literally. We'll go on our hikes and she'll open up a topic and we'll talk about it, whether it's adolescence or sex or whatever. These are conversations I never had with my parents. Never, zero, nothing, nada, right? And so I think that poor, one of the poor John, you had to you had to experience everything by yourself. <laughs> no, but I, I think that part of the part of the value of having access to information is it maybe takes away some of the initial uncertainty the kids have, and then they can engage in a discussion. Uh, but you know, 
every phase of life is different. And that's, I think my point is that we think, oh, if we miss that end part, then we really missed something. No, if, if we're so occupied all the time that we missed even this moment, this year, then you missed something important. You just said the word uncertainty. H Hannah, the character, uh, is uncertain about herself and her life. And yeah. uh, the danger I see at this time is also the constant, it's not only the fastness of things, it's the constant comparison. Yeah. Like if, you, if we would go, if I talk to my mother who is here with me on, in Cyprus right now, she's uh, uh, in her 70s and in her village where she grew up, there were two or three other young women she could compare herself with. <laughs> Now they open the internet, they can compare themselves with an influencer from whatever, Colombia. Right. It, 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 the pressure, I think, on young people is more than we had. To, I, think, I, I think so. I think it's, uh, I, th I would agree with what you're saying. And I would say the good news is that if we allow our kids to start to identify the things that they are passionate about. If we help them figure out their big five for life, mm -hmm. that the resources to enable them to live that life and get smart about that life or learn those skills is also unbelievable. Because let's say you're like, my daughter plays the ukulele. Mm -hmm. And so she, she decided she wanted to learn to play it, didn't know anything about it. And so in the same way that you're talking about, I could be influenced by an Instagrammer in Colombia or wherever she can also learn ukulele by someone in Colombia or wherever. And so, or in the city where you live in <laughs> or the city where you live in. Right. Yeah. Um, but the great thing is that if they have that comfort with, this is what I'm interested in. And, and this is who I see myself as they can find wonderful role model examples uh, on the internet as well. So that, I think the, yeah, right, the parenting game has changed. It's like yeah. helping the importance of helping them get comfortable in their own skin and develop their self-confidence early is ever more critical. Yeah. And the choices are wider and wider all the time. This is what I like in the in this um, dense space of the cafe, that in that in these walls, there's just that. And yeah. there's no internet at this moment. And there's nothing to compare. There's just, you have to have a talk with a person in front of you. And to be yeah. honest, I think that is the magic of your books. There's that, a that, 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 that the world around is pretty much for that time frame not yeah. existing. It's like you're soaked in into this room and that's it. And then you come out, you're not a different person, but your colors are more colorful. You, you know what I mean? Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there is a very conscious reason why the internet does not work at the cafe for exactly that, that reason that you're talking about. And I think books have a unique ability to do that they can transport us to another place. Uh, you can get so into the moment when you're reading that time stops. And then all of a sudden you sort of lift up your head and an hour has gone by and you've been in another world. And that's awesome. Like that is so fantastic. I, I love movies, but I, I think books have a way of transporting us in a way that is even more spectacular than movies do. Mm -hmm. And uh, a movie is also a great topic. Wasn't wasn't that the plan that uh, the cafe is being filmed, or was yeah, filmed the, or will be filmed, or is it? Yeah, still? Das Cafe am Rendevelt is coming to the big screen. Actually, uh, Till Schweiger is directing it. Uh, they've done some of the casting for some of the main roles already. And uh, yeah, no, I, because of COVID, uh, production was put on hold. Uh, otherwise, it probably would actually be coming out in 2022. But okay. um, yeah, so hopefully they'll be filming this summer. So I'm going to be wow. there in I'm going to be there May 17th to kick off the tour for the new book. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully we'll be in Munich to have some discussions about the film. And then hopefully I'll be back uh, later in the fall to actually be on set, because I think that would wow. be awesome to be on set. Yeah. And as I said, I would love to play a, a role like delivering mail or, or bringing the <laughs> The, the something that the cafe needs uh, uh waffle powder <laughs> coffee just let me carry sh something <laughs> there you go no i think that would be awesome yeah that was one of the one of the first texts i sent out I, I, for for people that uh, have not heard the story yet so when i heard some of the good news about the film i texted somebody was like dude you want to be an extra in the movie with me and uh so yeah no i think that would be super fun the, the funny thing is that i have very little control over those things like almost of zero course. control it, it, it's a it's a different uh production uh yeah company. but let's yeah. talk about but your that said it'd be fun if we can make it happen 
Yeah, but let's talk about uh, your tour a little bit. So you're having a tour in Germany. Um, yeah. How yeah, do you feel after, about that? Oh, I'm so excited about it because I, I mean, because of COVID, I haven't been able to interact with fans, haven't been able to travel in Germany for years now. And so uh, we decided to do something really special, which is we have a 20 day, 12 city tour going across Germany. We've got a tour bus, like a rock star tour bus, which is decorated in the theme of the cafe. Um, wow. we've got all kinds are you of driving stuff. or are you in the whirlpool? No, 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 no. I'll be in the back. In the whirlpool. <laughs> yeah, well, I wish. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, it's going to be a super cool experience. We've got all these really great selfie opportunities for people to take at the events. And uh, so, yeah, I think actually three of the 12 have sold out already. So uh, if you look, I'm sure we can include in the show notes or the links, yes, the link to the information. But uh, yeah, I cannot t to, ask, to answer your question. I'm so excited to see fans again, to interact with them, to have the chance to talk with them. Uh, so I can't wait. And how do you how do you prepare for the tour? Will you read out of the book? Is it like a is it a Q and A or how 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 will it be? Yeah, so it'll be a guided discussion. I have an amazing person who's on stage with me. She's a radio personality, and we've worked together in the past. She's awesome, and so the she'll do some readings in German from the book. I'll do one or two readings in English from the book. Then we'll have a discussion. We'll just engage in a discussion. People often ask about what language it'll be in. So it's a combination. Obviously I'll be talking in English and she and I will talk in English, but then she'll summarize things in German and she'll be doing her readings in German. So it's kind of a German English, I guess. We'll combine the two together. So Germany is looking for the release of the book we, because I, I heard it's not even released yet. It will be coming no. out uh, May next 17th. month, correct? Yeah. May 17th is the day they actually cut open the carton and put it on the bookshelves, yeah. Yeah. In, and in your case, in all bookshelves uh, uh, all over Germany, Austria and Switzerland, because we always forget the smaller countries, but Austria and Switzerland, they are very, very big fans of yours. Yeah, so, Zurich is one of the stops on the tour, actually. Perfect. Then we are looking forward to meet Hannah. We look forward to meet Max. We look forward to meet you in person. And we look forward to a couple of million more books that can help other people to be Max one day, because in this stage of life, you just help others. And if you get a little glimpse of this, everybody, you can already start today. Helping other people, is it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt. By the way, do you know the story of, uh, of the guy who um, who founded the Salvation Army that at the end um, he couldn't write anymore because when he was also like signing books and he had um, he had a disease where he cannot where he couldn't open his fingers anymore. So okay. for the last uh, couple of thousand copies, so that's a lot smaller than your scale. We're talking about millions, but he had thousands. He he signed with the word others. I, I find this very inspiring. Amazing. Yeah. I think as you're talking about where a single line or a single comment from somebody else, I find so much inspiration in a single story like that. Like mm -hmm. you, you just get these little glimpses into the way that another person has lived their life. And it's so inspiring to help you live your life in, in whatever path you want to walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love short little biographies like that. Uh Two last questions at the end that are really interest me. When you write a book, because we haven't never we have never talked about the technique, you just said it in a in a sentence within other sentences that <laughs> when it starts flowing through you, yeah, how do you do it? That whatever two, three, four, five, six months later, you have a paperback book. What what's the process? Yeah, I have a very specific process. So I'll walk you through the whole thing. Uh, when an idea for a book comes to me, and I think that's a book that wants to be written, then I will start capturing my thoughts and ideas and I keep them all in a single document on my laptop. And I will keep a notebook by my, my bed stand, my nightstand, uh, because I find I'll wake up first thing in the morning or I'm about to go to bed and I'll have this really good idea. And I've learned from experience, if I don't write it down, like it's just out it's so hard to recapture those sort of flash moments of inspiration okay um, so i also use I'm a, I'm a slow thinker first step everything goes on a note and i love the sentence if the can you say that again if the book wants to be written that is that yeah. it, it, it sounds like a human being but it's that's a very nice approach 
It is. Yeah. I don't start with saying, okay, it's 2023. I need a book. <laughs> I need a book. No, not at all. Um, if, if I don't feel a tremendous source of inspiration that says this is a story that is wanting to be birthed, then it's not my job to write it. Uh, but yeah, so then that's my process. And I use my phone now too. So if I have an idea, I'll record it using the voice recorder into my notes file. And then I will email that to myself. So I've always got a copy that is stored in case my phone gets lost or whatever the case is. Clever. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll do that for two months or so. And when I feel like I just, I don't know, Toby, it's one of those things where I just will get an intuitive sense. Like now is the time to write. And when that happens, I take my laptop, I go sit in the park and I read through all of my notes, all and it can be maybe 20, 30 pages of notes and ideas. And then I literally will reformat a document on my laptop so that it's the exact size of what I want the book to be at the end with the margins, with the, you know, the page height and width, because I want it to start having life. And that to me is part of the having life process. Mm. And then I literally start writing and I set a goal for myself of 10 pages a day. And I typically write in a natural setting. I'll go to the park, like I said, or I'll go somewhere else where I'm surrounded by quiet uh, nature sounds, except for that it's nice and quiet for me. Um, because I can't how you, write how do, you, how do you link the notes, like the chapters? Um, do you meditate I don't. before or you don't? Okay. I don't. Yeah, I just I'll read it all through and I just have this intuitive sense of like, here's where I start. And then if I start writing and I get stuck and I'm like, where do I go from here? I go back and I reread all the notes again. And it's amazing. It's like, oh, here we go. There's something that's exactly where I want to go. Okay, um, then you go back to that place. And how I but, do. The, but there's a lot of pages. How do you find exactly that spot? Oh, no, it's just, it's a connection with source material. It just, ha it just happens. Yeah. It's, I think, I think part of it is like, if you're thinking about going to Croatia on vacation, that your mind starts opening up a whole array of antennas, like get me Croatia information and you'll meet somebody in the coffee shop who's telling you about Croatia. You'll see a guidebook about next it. 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I think once you make that decision, like this is where I'm spending my time and focusing, it's like your antenna is up and your unconscious mind starts to like my, literally, I think your unconscious mind has memorized what's on all 30 pages. It already knows what's there. Mm -hmm. So when you go back into that document, it's actually sort of guiding you. Oh, look here, look there. Um, and so then I am very fanatical though, about writing the 10 pages a day. And that's the very first thing I have to do because I've learned from experience that if I get on my email, then the next thing I know it's noon or 12.30 or two o'clock. And then to sit down and write my 10 pages is not the same. So can't do anything else. Turn off the phone. Don't look at the email. Don't open the news. All I got to do is write my 10 pages. And some days I'll get so in the flow that 10, 10 pages becomes 20. It's just like, boom, boom, boom. But Other I hear, days I sit down I and it's this, much tougher. The secret is already the discipline of the 10 per day. That's yeah. un unnegotiable. Well, and here's why. So let's say that you decided you wanted to write a 250 page book that feels intimidating. But if you said, I'm going to do 10 pages a day, well, do the quick math. You're like 25 days. I can sit down for 25 days. I know yeah. I can sit down for 25 days. And I've learned from experience, 10 pages is about an hour and a half to two hours. So, okay. Can I sit down for two hours and work on this for 25 days? Of course I can. Anybody could. Yeah. Anybody. Could. So breaking it down into the simple uh, enables my brain to focus And it also is very gratifying because you get 10 pages on you're like, whoa, I'm 125th of the way there. Mm. So that's, so, that's the next step then. Then you do 10 pages per day. 10 pages a day. And then when I get to the point where I feel it's done, then I will go back and I will edit it. And I will probably edit it 30 to 40 times, literally. And the first 20 I do on the computer and then I start printing it because I see the pages differently when I look at the actual pages. Mm. Uh, when I feel it is done, done, I ask 10 people who I can count on for very critical feedback to read it and give me their honest opinion. And they and do it. They do, they do give cri very cru yeah. crucial, critical feedback. Yeah, because I, I tell them awesome. that. I pick, I pick people who I know will sort of honor that request. They're not looking for something that's wrong, but they're going to tell me, you know what, John? And I, I don't ask just for the things that they didn't connect with. I also ask for like, what made you cry? Um, mm -hmm. What made you laugh? And so if I have one of the 10 tell me, yeah, John, like that part didn't work with me. That's just an opinion. But if three of the 10 tell me chapter four, like you kind of lost me there, then I know, okay, I've got work to do. 
Can um, you, so can that's you, invaluable. Because I believe there are books and many people also who listen to this podcast. There's something in them that could be on paper. Um, yeah. could, could you give me an example where other people read it and you, they didn't get it, but it was crystal clear for you? Because I mm. think this is where people are also afraid about, about other people's opinions or it's not good enough or not understandable enough. And there we yeah. see you having sold seven million copies and it, it actually feels kind of good that it happens to you as well. <laughs> totally, totally. So I'll, I'll tell you one, this is, this is something where they felt something was missing. And so in the third cafe book, um, when I originally had my documents, right, the big document that I'm talking about, within that document was a very significant piece that said there should be a ladder from your godfather back to you. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote the whole book and I knew how many pages I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be about 160 pages. And so I wrote the whole book. Um, I could not, Toby, find a place to put this letter in there. It just, it just didn't fit, right? And so uh, I sent it off to everybody in my focus group, et cetera. And there was one person in my focus group, uh, Kristen, and she looked at it and she said, I just feel like there needs to be a, a tie back, right? This, this letter idea. And I think she, like, I hadn't told her that I had had that in my notes, but she said something like that, right? Well, I, I, I couldn't fit it. And again, that was just one person of the 10. So that could be just an opinion, but long story short on this, uh, six months later, I, by now the book is already in the hands of the editors. They're done with it. They've translated it, right? It's ready to be printed. Uh, I'm on a train in China. Have we talked about this? I don't think we've told the story, have I? No. Okay. So, yeah, so this goes back to the, why is this happening to me thing? So there's an amazing tie-in story for all the things we talked about. So I'm on to vacation with my family. I'm in China. I'm sick. I've got jet lag. I feel absolutely God awful. It's three in the morning. And I'm thinking to myself, I so wish I was home right now in my own bed. Mm -hmm. And all I could think about was, again, asking that question, why is this happening to me? You know, in the worst of those moments to try and ask with curiosity. So I was like, oh, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? And Toby, the overriding thing that came back to me was this letter, this letter that you had wanted. So here it is, middle of the night, I can't sleep anyway. I open up my computer, I look at the file and I'm looking at this idea, looking at this letter. I think about it for a while, I finally fall asleep. I wake up the next day and I'm like, I got a two hour train ride. I'm just gonna try and write the letter, right? Effortless, it flows off the pages, like unbelievable. So then I got a half an hour left of the train ride. I'm like, well, let me see if I can figure out where I would put it in the story which before I could not, I could not figure out where this thing would go. I look at this story in five minutes, Toby. It is so obvious to me, like where this needs to go. I, I dump it in there. I re-edit the whole document. Oh, and by the way, this goes back to the synchronicity. The, the file that I'd sent off before to the publisher was 154 pages, right? Mm -hmm. And my goal was 160. That's what I thought the book yeah. was going to be. I put in the letter, I reformat everything, I re-edit everything, it's perfect, I love it. I look at the page count, 160. Okay, that's the bing bing from the universe. But then it gets even better because I, from the train, send an email to my, my editor and I say, hey, I know this is gonna sound crazy and I know you may have actually already printed the books, but here's the whole story. <laughs> Sorry, right? we have to undo it. Yeah, no, I said, I said literally in the second printing, maybe you can change it. She sends back an email instantly. She's like, oh my God. She's like, this morning, I authorized them to start printing, but I got your email and I told them, don't print. No. The translator who translates all of your works is in my office for a totally different reason. She's working on it right now. And here's the thing. For anybody who's read the third book in the cafe series, the letter is the thing that everybody tells me, like that was the thing that brought them to tears. So had this person not have dropped that seed for me, then when I had the moment six months later, I don't think I'd have listened to it with the same intensity. Haven't you, wouldn't you have been in, in China feeling unwell, opening the laptop in the middle of the night, going through pain? Because yeah. that's also sometimes that can happen that something grows out of pain. I have to do something. Wow, yeah. what an incredible story. Yeah. So, and I'll tell you, it's because we were talking about letting go and, and people passing from our lives. So this is tied into that maybe. So, so when I wrote the original book, um, my godfather was still alive. He was very old and he was experiencing severe dementia, but he was still alive. And 
when I had the experience in China, he had passed. And when I reflect on that, I think maybe Toby, part of the reason I couldn't find the place in the story for the letter is because I couldn't accept the fact that he was going to die. Wow. Yeah. And I had to go through that process and I had to go through the grieving process before I would allow myself to come to terms with the fact that that was really going to happen. And I was really going to have to deal with that. And I was going to have to say goodbye. Um, so yeah, there's because so that, much that, going that, on. Yeah, that connection at this moment when he passed got stronger, not weaker. And it had to, yeah. Be mm. Yeah. That, that's what I mean. This cosmic algorithm of the universe, the fact that there is so much going on behind the scenes mm. that we'd have no concept of, but as you said, so beautifully, when we take time to just pause mm. and think about like, what is going on and who are the people in my life? You start to see these things that are so beyond our ability to create and manifest that there are these connections and they're, and they're beautiful. We couldn't find a better ending and uh, taking the word connections. Uh, it's a, it's a great opportunity uh, to connect with you for the third time here. And also for the audience that you're coming to Germany. And I think uh, again, as I've recommended it the last time, Uh, everybody should read uh, Die Überraschung am Café am Ende der Welt. Uh, am, am Ende. I always say the end. Rande, the, the edge <laughs> am Rande der Welt. And I'm very much looking forward that you are visiting our country and going to Switzerland also. Thank you for all your amazing books, for, your, for just being you, for just being you. I think that that can also be said because as, I, as we talked about before, uh, we had a very nice evening in Frankfurt together. And it's, um, I meet sometimes people who write very interesting books. And if you meet them in person, you are like, did that person write that book? Unbelievable. <laughs> and with you, it, to me, it was very, um, you are very much like you are right now, like as a public figure privately on the table and this is what i admire most in people just being how they are thank you for doing that thank you and right back at you i know from my interactions with people and from having had the pleasure of reading your books and uh, writing the forward for one that the work that you do is out there changing people's lives i always tell people because you asked a question about what is what should somebody do if they have a book inside of them and never allow the fact that somebody else has written books keep you from writing your book because mm -hmm. there's someone who needs to, there's somebody who it, unbox your life was the moment when somebody went from, I'm so afraid and I don't know what I want to do with my life. And then they read you and they read about your courage and your story and the guidelines and the in, insights that you shared in your book. And that was the catalyst. Mm -hmm. And somebody who's listening to this, that has a book within them, their book is yeah. going to be the catalyst for another human being. So yeah. let it out. If you feel like it needs to come out. That's very encouraging that you say it. And I had a professor at university. He said, we are always standing on the shoulder of giants. Yeah. You cannot invent something that hasn't been thought about, but you can make it your story. And that's yeah. unique. And this is how unique we all billions of people are. Uh, uh, if you have the, the, the urge of writing a book, that's a sign of the universe. You should do it. Totally. Totally. Thank you. That's a nice. Thanks, Toby. Uh, uh, what's the English word? Finnish word in German is Schlusswort. How do you say it in English? A nice ending. <laughs> a nice ending. Perfect ending. Nice ending. See you in Germany. And everybody, kauf das neue Buch von John Strilecki. Es ist wunderbar. I just said they have to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> kaufen, Thanks, kaufen, Toby. kaufen. <laughs> <laughs> So, also in diesem Sinne, ihr Lieben, ich mache, wir machen jetzt hier Schluss. John und ich reden noch ein bisschen. Wenn dir die Folge gefallen hat, sei so lieb, gib uns eine Bewertung und lieb viel, 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 viel Freude mit dem Buch.